All right, at 7 o'clock, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's go ahead and uh, have a roll call and pledge. Here. All right, let's say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, just a quick reminder to the public, um, everybody who's on this list gets three minutes. Um, at three minutes, I'll have to cut you off. If your name's not on the list, you can say something, but you'll have to wait till the end of today's meeting. And is anybody on the list that is under the age of 18 who has school tomorrow? Okay, so you three are on here? Yeah, you guys, I'm going to make sure. I'm going to do you solid. I'm going to get you to school on time. So get ready. You three will go first. Are you Natalie, Hazel, and Greg? What are your names? Ma Natalie? You're e is Eli talking too? No? Okay, just you. And then Clyde. Clyde, you want to, you're not saying nothing though, right, Clyde? Oh, Natalie, Clyde, and Eli, Central Elementary. All right, you'll be up here in just a sec. Get ready. Okay, um, let's go ahead. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of February 11th, 2020? So moved. Second. Mayor Bagley. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm, I am uh, unclear of uh, how to, it, w with approval of these minutes, uh, to correct the record of the February 11th meeting. Because if you go to number 13 on these minutes, it's a summary. It's not an inaccurate summary, but a summary of council members. Oh, yeah, your, your mic's off. Well, I don't have a... No, your mic's off. Well, talk to those guys. Um, uh, at the end of the meeting, Councilmember Peck made a statement. Uh, the, 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 what's in the minutes is, uh, I have no doubt, a correct summary of the statement. The problem is it's an incomplete summary. And in the statement, uh, there were a couple comments that were made, that uh, two of which I believe to be inaccurate, one of which I know to be inaccurate, and it, it involved my name. So I'm, I'm, I'm not certain how, uh, uh, it's my understanding that the, that the video is the official record of the meeting, not the minutes. But if we approve these minutes without correcting that record, then the, the statement stands, I guess, as, as, facts, as fact or truth. Well you, can, well, you can either vote for the motion, against the motion, or I, make I'm, a motion I'm, to amend. I'm, I'm, I'd like to correct the record of the February 11th meeting. You tell me when I can do that, if not now. Uh, no, you can do it now. So then I want to correct the record now. It is not a matter of voting on these minutes. Correct. You'd the statement that was made was inaccurate. I have a, I transcribed the statement if people would like a copy of it. Uh, there, were, there was, here are the statements that I believe to be inaccurate. And I, this is out of context, but there's a statement that the core requests for everything that is on the city server. This was in response to comments that were made about emails. Uh, it's my understanding that when a CORA request is made, it is not limited to what is on the city's or the, a council member's email account or on the city's server. It is for everything, every email that has to do with potential city business, regardless of the server on which it sets. Since I asked that question of the city attorney and got the confirmation. So I want to, I if uh, that, that was a statement that was made, I believe it needs to be corrected. There's a second, ref, second time, there's a second time in that statement that, that's, that that is also said. That, either servers, uh, that, e that emails are on the city server and that that's what a CORA request was for. I believe the CORA requests are for everything that is city business. So both of those statements are incorrect. Then there was a reference to how Council Member Peck handles CORA requests and equated her response to the same way I've responded to CORA requests. And the fact is we have responded differently. Our, our, be, our responses cannot be equated and I would like it, I'd like it to be corrected in the record that when, when there have been CORA requests for my records, I've handed over my devices, all of them, so the staff decides, not me, the staff decides what is or is not city business 
on my private email accounts. That is not how Council Member Peck responded to the core request, and I want that clearly stated in the minutes of this meeting since we can't get it in the minutes of the last meeting. Okay, so Council Member Mac Peck made a statement, which is on the record. Dr. Waters has now made a statement on the record. No motion has been made, but there's a motion on the floor to pass the approval of minutes of February 11th, 2020. Seeing no further debate or dialogue. Oh, sorry, Council Member Christensen. Well, I'm a little puzzled. It did Councilman Waters say this at that the February meeting? Because otherwise, this is there, there's, a there's there's currently no motion. Meaning, okay. right, all we're doing is voting to approve the February 11th, 2020 minutes. Okay. If those were not stated, then then we can't put them in. There's no motion. Okay. So all right. all right, all right. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye or nay. Nay. All right. That passes six to one with Council Member uh, Waters dissenting. Or did you vote as well? I was not present, so I don't have a vote. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, well, it's a little tricky because, kids, the mayor is not this dumb, <laughs> usually. Actually, some in the audience would say, yes, I am. But I, was, I, I can't hear. So, yeah, all right. So it was 5-4, Dr. Waters against, and uh, Councilmember Martin abstaining. Let's move on to agenda revisions and submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. The only thing I want known uh, that you guys to know is that I asked Harold and spoke with Eugene, but he's not in charge of the agenda. Um, we were there, there. There was a group, uh, Green Solutions, that's a publicly traded entity that uh, will be purchasing um, some local dispensaries, one or more. And so uh, I talked to Harold about bringing it back. It sounds like it's going to come back in April sometime, in order to talk about how that might. Uh, we might better reflect and match state law. So um, you, you, I'm sure Abby Driscoll has approached one or all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, bring it back to discuss. So that's already on there. Is it April or May, Don? We had the marijuana conversation. It's tentatively scheduled for May. May, April. April. Okay, so. So it's more than that because as they change state law, there's a number of issues that have come out. And so we need to have a broader conversation on things that we need to clean up in general to bring in concert with state law. So it's really more than just that issue that we need to bring forward. Okay. All right. Mayor, I have a couple other agenda revisions. Absolutely just not. For the, just absolutely for the not, record. Don. Absolutely not. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> just wanted to note there was a revised resolution for item 8K that was published. Additionally, there was a revised attachment 1 for item 9B that was also published and provided to council. Uh, also wanted to note on item 8A, uh, the second reading date is incorrect. That will be April 14th, and I will read that into the record correctly. Okay. And then finally, uh, Sandy emailed you all. There, is n there are no bills for consideration, so your general business item about legislative is awesome. removed. All right, cool. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so let's move on to city manager. You don't have a report, do you? All right. So let's go ahead and uh, have a proclamation designating March 2020 as Census Awareness Month in Longmont, Colorado. Um, so who here is to, who, who here is to, Aaron, you can come on up. Who else is here to talk about the census? So come on up everybody while I read this and then everybody will take a picture. When you say everybody, you mean everybody who's here? Everybody. Uh, because they all count, right? All right. So this is a proclamation designating March 2020 as Census Awareness Month in Longmont, Colorado. Whereas April 1st, 2020 is Census Day for the United States of America pursuant to Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution, the 2020 Census, a once-a-decade population count, will be open to the public to self-report on March 12, 2020, and will continue through July 31st with an ideal deadline of May 12th for everyone in Longmont to complete the Census. And whereas the fair allocation of federal dollars for public health, education, transportation, child and elder care, food assistance, emergency preparedness, disaster response, and many other critical programs and services depends on complete and accurate age, population, and other demographic information gathered every 10 years. And whereas an accurate census is required for the proper apportionment of representatives with the legislative bodies of the U.S. House of Representatives and Colorado State Legislature and is used in the redistricting of state and county voting districts, and whereas information collected by the U.S. Census Bureau is confidential and protected by law and any data related to the census can only be released in aggregate form that does not identify individual respondents, 
And whereas the city of Longmont's complete count committee is directly working to ensure everyone counts in Longmont and is also supporting the efforts of the other complete count committees in Boulder County, including the city of Boulder, University of Colorado Boulder, and Boulder County nonprofit CCCs to increase community participation in the 2020 census. Now, therefore, I, Brian J. Bagley, mayor, by virtue of the authority vested in me and the city council of the city of Longmont, do hereby proclaim March 2020 as Census Awareness Month in Longmont. And I urge all residents of Longmont to participate in the 2020 census to ensure everyone counts in Longmont. Sign me. So, <coughs> Aaron? Uh, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Aaron Fosdick with the Planning and Development Services Department. I'm joined by uh, co-chair of the Longmont Complete Count Committee, Carmen Ramirez, and several members of the Longmont Complete Count Committee. And we appreciate you proclaiming March 2020 as Census Awareness Month. It's hard to believe, but we're less than 20 days away from the invitations to respond to the census being mailed out to all Longmont residents and all residents of the United States. So that will begin on March 12th. We are really um, making a strong push for everyone in Longmont to respond either via mail, phone, or for the first time ever online. So the census is going to be easier than ever to respond. As we've mentioned um, in the past, several times when we've talked to you and as, as the mayor just read in this proclamation, um, the census is incredibly important to Longmont. We estimate that for every resident, which currently is about 97,000 people living in Longmont, the census will uh, test our estimates and see how close we are. For every resident, we get about $1,500 per year per resident. So you can see that that's an incredible amount of money that's coming to our community. Colorado also stands to gain another seat in Congress, which is incredibly important to our state. And so an accurate, um, complete count is exceptionally important. The county is putting a lot of resources to this. We're pleased tonight to be joined by newly hired um, county census campaign manager, as well as an outreach coordinator. And so we're really working closely with our county partners, um, other local uh, complete count committees, nonprofits, businesses, as well as residents, just to get the word out. And so we appreciate the work that all of you are doing, really appreciate the work that the community and our uh, community partners are doing and are excited to make sure everyone in Longmont counts. Carmen, do you want to add anything? Carmen or Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> now there's two Carmen's. Yeah. Uh, Carmen Ramirez, City of Longmont. Um, good evening. Just want to let you know that we are making all sorts of efforts. I've been doing presentations on all sorts of groups from Boy Scouts to uh, immigrants that are learning English to parents at all of our Title I schools. So we're making those efforts in partnership with Pamela and Carmen, who are part of uh, Boulder County. So we're making sure to reach out to all of their communities. We've done the education, we've done the outreach. Now we need to encourage and motivate people to respond. So, Alcalde, do you want to say it in Spanish? What? Alcalde, do you want to say it in Spanish? What do you want me to say in Spanish? Complete su censo. I can, I can complete tu censo. Complete su censo. Todos cuentan en Longmont. Todos cuentan en Longmont. Tres maneras fáciles para responder. Tres maneras super fáciles para responder. ¿Cuáles son? Internet, correo y teléfono. Ok. Gracias. Gracias. Hablo español y también puedo decir lo que él me dice. Entonces. All right. So let's go ahead. Yeah. No, it's not it. Why don't we ask everybody here, except one person with a camera, to take a picture. <laughs> so come on up, everybody. Congratulations. You're going to be in city history. Where are we gonna, maybe right there, Carmen, right here. Because there's two why, do, why don't we, way. actually, why don't we, uh, there we go. Just don't go in the middle. Trip hazard city. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was my point. Just don't go that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those cords. It reminds me of the Christmas story. Yes. Dangerous yeah. Christmas light city. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, guys. Yeah. Very good. You might need to be right here, Sandy. I know. I was going to say, this might be the exact same spot.
All right. And again, there's no census question or a citizenship question on the census, which means that if you are undocumented, you can talk and answer and no one's going to know anything about you other than you're part of the mass, which is Longmont. So, all right, let's move on to first call public invited to be heard at this time. The infamous citizens of Longmont, known as Natalie Brenna, Clyde Guliza, and Eli Blomker. All right, come on up, guys. Okay. Here you go. I'm gonna let you just hold it. How about that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, come on. There you go. Yeah, go ahead. Say your, say your names and addresses and then go on in. Let us know what you want to say. Okay, so I am Natalie Brenna, and with me today are Clyde Galizia and Eli Blomaker. So I live on 516 Collier Street. I live on 1345 South Grand Street. And I live on 625 Kenmore Court. We are from Central Elementary and are working on our international Black Gloria exhibition. We would like to talk about plastic and the harmful effects it has on the environment. To start off, plastic is killing innocent ocean animals like the leatherback sea turtle. Globally, it is estimated that over 100 million marine animals are killed each year by plastic waste. Animals eat plastic bags thinking that it is their prey and they die. We would like to ban plastic bags like this one from stores. This would save countless lives of animals. It would not be a big change since stores like Natural Grocers and Adorn have already started using paper bags. Reusable bags would also be a good option. If you decide that you want to do something smaller, you could find people one to two dollars for each plastic bag they use, which would still be effective. Remember, we only have one Earth. We should always use our precious resources we have. Please consider our idea. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Well done. Well done. All right. Uh, Hazel Gordon. Thank you. After that impressive display, I don't know what to say. Uh, I'm Hazel Gordon, and uh, for the last uh, year and a half, I've been living at 1600 Atkinson Avenue in Longmont. Uh, after my retirement, I moved here to Colorado, which I consider my home. Um, my training, my uh, career was in ecology, and my training directs me to observe human actions and the consequences from perspectives of time as well as scale. By scale, I mean that an action is analyzed at the ground level as well as from an aerial or maybe a broader perspective, as ecologists tend to do. I'm speaking to urge you to reverse the decision last year that allowed the creation of metro residential districts after some 15 years of disallowing them to occur in Longmont. From the perspective of looking at future and ground level scenarios, I understand that residents of such districts are likely to be assessed future fees for maintenance and other services that they did not anticipate and perhaps cannot afford. 
this has been reported many times in the Denver Post articles and speakers here at the City Council, so I won't uh, reverberate such things. Um, I also understand that unless such residents of these districts have the time and motivation um, for taking leadership roles in their districts on boards, perhaps, they usually do not have the power to direct planning efforts within their districts. I may be wrong on that interpretation, but that's what I understand. To my mind, this appears to be unjust in a democratic society, since the city cannot remedy a developer's inability to live up to the requirements of its contract in a service agreement. Uh, in addition to these aspects, I call your attention to look at the broader perspective from the viewpoint of cumulative effects of Longmont's population growth trajectory and the future trends of how our city will grow. The paving over of random and diverse areas of semi-natural and exotic grasslands and the soils by such metro districts impacts the atmosphere. And I hope that it is a, of concern to the city's climate change initiatives. For example, it enlarges the city's heat island warming effect through the additional impermeable pavements and buildings required for these districts. It also narrows the city's ability to allow natural processes to sequester carbon within our soils that remain and the intact vegetation that remains. Thank, right. you. thank you. I'm going to have to anyway, cut you off. But thank you thank for you. allowing me to address these issues. No, thank you. All right, Greg Morrissey. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, staff. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. And the thing I'm going to bring up is about the emails and the emails being used by staff members. They are using their personal email instead of using city emails. From the research I've done, this is against the law. I would like to see that stop, please. Keep that data secure on city servers. Do not use your personal email. And if people are doing that by accident or something, they should come forth and say, this won't happen anymore. This creates a opportunity for integrity across the entire city, done with the staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Kevin Gallagher. Good evening. Thank you for hearing me. My name is Kevin Gallagher. I live at 9376 Rogers Road. I still do here in Longmont. And I'm here tonight to talk about the special metro financing districts. When you work on it tonight to uh, undo and revoke the residential district that you extended to Mr. Mulshine and the development that's currently plaguing our road. Um, I hope that you will no also uh, remove, revoke, and cancel the special metro financing district that you granted to him, a residential development. Because if you don't, basically you've effectively changed a law solely at the crest of one man for one man, which is illegal under our Constitution. And to that effect, um, I would hope that maybe you might reinstate the appeal that you undid to us, Mr. Mayor, this past year when we had a reasonable appeal because you pushed through the preliminary plot with 12 to 13 missing items, information that we as residents, as neighbors that are considered under the code that you're responsible to, never had any information to even understand the impacts of the development. But it's clear that on a road with 30 homes, all zoned rural, 400 new condos in the middle of our street is gonna have an impact on traffic. A new traffic study that we got after the preliminary pat was passed said that 15% of the cars from 400 new homes are gonna come onto Rogers Road. That's a joke. A reasonable person would see that as a joke. The drainage study that came out last summer actually said that we can withstand two feet of standing water on our properties because we're in a high impact flood zone. How did you get Mountain Brook out of that flood zone? There's something really corrupt going on in this process here from the very start. And as evidenced by a core request that we did receive for a very small period of time, it shows a highly undue influence and familiar relationship between Councilmember Waters, Martin, and you, Mayor Bagley, 
all throughout this process for the last few years on Mountain Brook, which you should have disclosed and you should have recused yourself from the appeal process because you had ex parte communications with one of the plaintiffs in a quasi-judicial setting, which is also illegal. So I'm asking you to do the right thing, to avoid corruption, to be, as these last two people said, open, honest, and transparent government that you purport to be, and do the right thing by us. This is not a NIMBY. We're not against the development. We're against the process in which you've completely alienated and ignored us this entire time. We have property rights guaranteed by the state and the federal government, and we're going to continue to act upon them and work to preserve them throughout this entire process. We're not going anywhere. We love living in Longmont. And you should appreciate that and treat us with the respect we deserve. Thank you so much. Stick around. I'll respond. All right. Uh, let's see here. Kevin Mulshine. Mayor. Uh, after Kevin Mulshine, there's one more. Deb McClintock. She's on my list. Okay, great. Hello, Mayor, City Council. Uh, Kevin Mulshine, 5139 uh, Old Ranch Drive. I'll make it quick. Uh, I know where, obviously, where this council is going on the ordinance on special districts. Uh, the only issue I have is when you say, if you look at the lead into your ordinance, the, you state you're re, uh, stopping them for the following reasons. If you go through the reasons, you say uh, Longmont has had development for 15 years and this will not uh, adversely affect development. I believe last week you discussed the total lack of middle class housing in the city. So yeah, we've had developing, but we haven't we haven't done anything for the middle class. Frankly, we're providing more middle class housing in the city than anybody is. And we're investing a lot of money to do that. So that's, that's opinion or false at, uh, at best. Uh, it says that people will be taxed for things that they don't get the benefit of. They don't get a commensurate benefit of. You can't have a district unless you provide those benefits. That's false. Uh, the, the, the reasons you have in there, frankly, are all false or just opinion. So if you're gonna have an ordinance, at least put it, just say, we don't want to have the districts. I think that'd be better. Uh, I do feel compelled to speak because the last speaker made reference to a lot of meetings. Uh, I can tell you, I can remember a lot of meetings with a lot of council people, and I can remember meetings out on dirt fields, which have nothing to do with our developments that have to do with Habitat for Humanity, that had to do with schooling, that had to do with issues to make the city be better. I moved here to make the city better. So I talked to a lot of people about trying to make it better. So I take offense to any insinuation that anything below board is going here. I've been told very strongly by this council to provide a community that provides middle class housing and can you help something for the people at the lowest end of the spectrum. We've done that. It's done nowhere else in the country and we're not going to apologize for it. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, who's the last one? Deb McClintock. Deb McClintock. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and Council. Um, this is an article that was in the Denver Post. Okay, thank you. In December 2019, Colorado Metro districts and developers create billions of debt, leaving homeowners with soaring tax bills. My name is Deb McClintock. I live at 1100 East 17th Avenue here in Longmont. And I'm here to caution you about Metro districts. We moved here from Texas back in the 80s and we bought a home in an area in Douglas County. It was called Roxborough Village. We were unaware of really what a Metro district was and no one ever really mentioned what it was about or anything. It was a fire district one. And um, after we'd been there for several years, all of a sudden there was a meeting called that all the homeowners had to get together and we were informed there had not been enough houses that had most been sold in that subdivision. So therefore, the cost for the infrastructures was being passed on to the homeowners there. Of course, that caused a lot of financial difficulties with people because they were not ex expecting such huge property taxes to be what they were. So I am hoping that you guys will, will take a, a look at this again. Um, there's an area up in uh, Loveland Johnstown area called the Thompson River Ranch subdivision where this is happening again. People are thinking that their mortgage is going to be a certain amount and their taxes will be a certain amount, not understanding how the metro district works. And so what happens when they don't sell enough houses, then all that debt is put back on the homeowners. And it causes a lot of people to lose their homes. And I could see where 
people would be foreclosed on these houses here in Longmont and you would be left with empty houses. And that's not uh, good for the area at all. And Highlands Ranch, for instance, they were supposed to be the pinnacle of a metro district. After 40 years, they're still in debt, $30 million. After all those houses, you know how big Highlands Ranch is. There's thousands of homes there, and they're still in debt that much money. So I am requesting that the council would really take, a, take time to research these metro districts because the boards are run by the developers and the builders, and they are the ones that vote on the tax increases, and no one can stop them. They're their own little government. So I would ask that you would take a look at this and um, make sure that this type of situation does not happen in Longmont and that forces people out of their homes. There's a bunch of people up in Loveland that are being foreclosed on up there as, we, as I'm speaking. So please take a look at that before you approve a bunch of metro districts here in Longmont. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, that will conclude today's public invited to be heard. And just let me make a bl Yes, uh, you get, you'll have the opportunity at the end to talk if you want to say something, Ms. Bassett, but we got to, uh, the rules are that if you didn't get on the list, you got to wait till the end. So just generally speaking, I just, I mean, I think I speak for all the council. I don't care what side of an issue you're on. Um, having served here for eight years and knowing everybody at this dais, um, some people's names, uh, yeah, well, I don't care what the topic was tonight. I can vouch that everybody up here for the thousand dollars that they get paid every month puts in the time, the emotion, the energy, and the love. And uh, I'm just tired of hearing the word corruption. I get $1,500 a month. And uh, just because council members do not agree with one of 100,000 people in Longmont does not make us corrupt. It makes us a representative democracy and we're up here trying to do the good of the people and we all have better things to do. If we're gonna get yelled at and accused of crime and corruption, I guarantee you nobody up here is a criminal. Nobody up here is corrupt. We're doing the best we can with what we've got. And so uh, sometimes I know I'm supposed to be quiet, but after being two years in this seat, I don't do that anymore. People stand up here and they want to pick out people on staff for this council. I'm going to start push, pushing back and just saying, you're wrong. So anyway, you're wrong. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the consent agenda. Can you go ahead and read that for us? Mayor, item 8A is ordinance 2020-02009, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 14.32 of the Longmont Municipal Code on Rates and Regulations Governing Electric Service, Public Hearing and Second Reading, scheduled for April 14, 2020. 8B is Ordinance 02020-10, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of four 10-foot wide utility easements in the Prairie Village subdivision generally located adjacent to Alpine Street, Public Hearing and Second Reading, scheduled for March 17, 2020. 8C is Ordinance 2020-11, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 4.10 of the Longmont Municipal Code on Special Districts Policies and Procedures, public hearing and second reading scheduled for March 17, 2020. 8D is Resolution 2020-17, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Memorandum of Understanding between the City and UHS of Centennial Peaks, LLC, DBA Centennial Peaks Hospital to facilitate providing effective and efficient access to behavioral services to individuals in custody. 8E is Resolution 2020-18, a resolution of the Longmont City Council establishing the fee for cash in lieu of water rights transfers. 8F is Resolution 2020-19, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County Public Health for farm to early childhood education and Farmers Market Food Assistance Incentives Programs. 8G is Resolution 2020-20, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the state of Colorado for a library grant. 8H is Resolution 2020-21, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Regional Air Quality Council for grant funding for an electric vehicle charging station. 8I is Resolution 2020-22, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Workforce Boulder County for internship sponsor agreements from March 2020 through February 2022. 8J is Resolution 2020-23, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement 
between the City and the Bureau of Consumer Protection of the Federal Trade Commission for a Consumer Sentinel Network Confidentiality and Data Security Agreement with an addendum. 8K is Resolution 2020-24, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a voluntary alternative agreement for the Longmont Family Apartments development as satisfaction of the city's inclusionary housing requirements. All right, I assume that's it. Good job, take a breath. Good job, round of applause, Don. Round of applause. All right, so do we have a motion or before that, do we have anything that we wanna pull? I move that we approve the agenda. It's been moved that we pass the consent agenda. It's been moved and seconded. I think we need to pull C <laughs> and uh, K. All right. Uh, Dr. Waters would like to pull C and K. Would you like to restate your motion? I'm not telling you to, I'm asking. <laughs> um, okay, I move we approve the consent agenda pulling C and K. It's been moved and seconded. Councilmember Martin? I am sorry. I uh, received a, a query from a constituent about E, and so I would like to pull E. All right. Councilmember Christensen, is it okay if we pull E? Uh, yes. All right. So I'll take that as an amended, an amended motion. So the motion is that we pass the consent agenda, last C, E, and K. It has been seconded by Council Member Peck. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Getting a verbal and a, and a, and a, and a visual nod. Let's go ahead and vote. All, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. All right, let's go on to ordinances and second reading and public hearings on, on the following matters 9A, Ordinance 2020-07A, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the Pepler Neighborhood Concept Plan Agreement, generally located between Alpine Street, Tularosa Lane, Winding Drive, and Canadian Crossing Drive. Um, is there anyone here from the public that would like to speak? We'll go ahead and have a public hearing on this matter. All right, seeing no one, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Any questions or comments from council? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. I move approval of ordinance 2020-07A. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right, that passes six to one with council member Waters <coughs> opposed. Let's move on to 9B. Public hearing and consideration of recommendations for 2020 Community Development Block Grant Program Funding for Draft 2020 CDBG Program Action Plan. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and open up this for public hearing. I don't think there's a staff presentation, right? There is. All right. Let's go ahead and. Oh yeah, that's right. 2020. You mean the one that says 2020 CDBG Action Plan? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Kathy Fedler, Housing and Community Investment um, Division Manager for the City. So tonight is the public hearing for the proposed 2020 um, Community Development Block Grant Action Plan. And um, this one was um, updated in your packet because right after it went out, we got word from HUD what our actual allocation was going to be so we could put actuals in here instead of our estimated costs. So what we're looking at for CDBG funding in 2020 is $610,926, which is a reduction of um, $12,000 from uh, 2019, or about 2%, um, and a total of 6.2% uh, reduction um, from 2018. So uh, the chart on the far right gives you an idea of um, where we have been over the years. 651000 was our highest allocation. <clears throat> We also have 360,417, and there's another typo in there, um, dollars uh, to be reallocated, and this is primarily from program income that we received at the very end of 2019 um, from uh, repayment of the Thistle loans when we refinanced their um, properties here. They had some loans that they um, paid back. And then we're estimating about $20,000 in um, program income to come in in 2020. So this is a total of about 991,000. 
Um, we took applications in um, October. We opened those up in October. They were due November 4th. We received five um, total housing applications. Um, two of those were referred for the CDBG funding, and I'll get into those in a little bit. Um, we also have a, a city fund request for um, Homeless Solutions for Boulder um, County program. Um, our ongoing rehab program funding that uh, we operate um, with city staff, and then the housing counseling program. The 2020 action plan um, will be due to HUD by, we're hoping mid-April, we have a new five-year consolidated plan that will cover 2020 to 2024 that we're working on right now. That has to go in first, um, so um, that has to move along um, before we can submit our action plan. Um, the public hearing is required that we're holding tonight, and a 30-day public notice is also required. We started that notice period January 29th, and it will end on March 2nd. So looking a little closer on what we're recommending funding for our housing rehab programs, a total of just over $300,000 um, for the single family homeowner occupied um, rehab program, the architectural barrier removal program, the emergency grant program that helps with health and safety issues, mobile home repair, and then our program delivery costs um, to operate that program. About 29 or so households should be assisted with this funds. <clears throat> um, the next recommendation is the Boulder County Housing Counseling and Personal Finance Program. This would be a $50,000 grant. This is a program, um, the counseling is required by our down payment assistance and rehab programs. In addition, they also provide um, credit um, counseling. Um, they help with folks that need a spending plan, are trying to reduce debt. Uh, improve their credit, includes foreclosure prevention if that's needed, and reverse mortgage um, counseling as well. This project leverages over $300,000 um, in other funding, and we expect about 240 lower income residents will be assisted. Um, the Homeless Solutions for uh, Boulder County support is um, $56,600 as grants for security or utility deposits. So as people get referred that are um, um, experiencing homelessness get referred um, for housing, um, the vouchers, the locally funded vouchers that were um, approved as part of the 2020 budget and some of the vouchers that Longmont Housing Authority has set aside um, will be used to get folks into housing. Um, as they move into that, they're gonna need security and utility deposit um, assistance, so th these funds would be provided for that. We're anticipating about 23 households um, would be um, assisted with um, these funds. And then the two project funding recommendations, one is for the in-between to acquire property. Um, it'd be $154,170 grant they're also receiving a loan from the Affordable Housing Fund in the amount of $100,000. Um, six to 12 housing units are expected to be created once they find a property. Um, and there are a lot of caveats on that funding, which we went through in the Affordable Housing Fund um, approvals, um, but basically that they have to have a purchase within 12 months of contract. Um, they have to have a minimum of at least six units in the project, one unit able to be fully accessible, and they have to provide documentation of their um, other financing before we would enter into a contract, uh, purchase contract. <clears throat> and then the other project is the Longmont Housing Authority Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments Refinance and Rehab. Um, this is a $300,000 grant from 2020 funds that will go along with the $175,000 grant already approved from um, 2019 funds, and it will preserve um, 50 housing units for um, low-income seniors. And then finally, um, we're setting aside 20%, the maximum amount for um, program administration. It's about 126,000. Again, this is the maximum. We go ahead and hold out. If we don't need it, it gets reallocated for um, projects. So altogether, we're looking at about 350 households that would be served with this funding, 29 under the rehabilitation program, 23 homeless, eight um, new affordable rental units created, taking an average between six and um, 12, and then 50 rental homes for seniors preserved, and then 240 households helped to remain stable through the housing counseling program. 
So this is about 2,800 investment per household assisted, and um, about $11.6 million would be um, leveraged and other funds brought into our community with these funds. This just gives, it's a little bit hard to see, but it just um, goes through and, and shows the, exactly what we just went through um, in the format that we usually provide to HUD. And the uh, amounts highlighted are the ones that, um, that were lowered um, in order when we got less grant than we had anticipated. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, you can go ahead and hold the public hearing and take action. All right, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and open it for public hearing at this time. Is there anyone here that would like to say anything on this issue? All right, seeing no one, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a vote or a vote? Do we have a motion? Would someone like to make a motion? Okay, I move, <laughs> I move that, uh, what do we need to do here? Do we need to do anything? So you'd be approving Second. submission to HUD um, contingent that we don't receive any comments between now and March 2nd. Uh, so moved. Second. All right, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. I made the motion and Councilman Waters seconded it. All right, let's go on to items removed from the consent agenda. We've been cru cruising along 45 minutes into the meeting. We're through the consent agenda. Anybody need a break? I'm assuming not. Let's go ahead and start with the easy stuff. Uh, Councilmember Martin, do you want to start with uh, 8E? Yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, uh, I, uh, I received an email from a constituent at the very last minute this evening. Um, normally, I would have answered him. Uh, these questions were, have been addressed by the Water Board adequately, in my opinion, and uh, I uh, uh, am the council liais liaison to the water board, but that doesn't mean I have all these numbers on the top of my head. Um, normally, Mr. Thompson would come down here and ask the questions um, himself in public, invited to be heard, but he was not able to be here tonight, so I am going to ask a reasonable number of them uh, and uh, uh, let Mr. Hoosen um, answer them. Um, so first of all, um, he would like to know, based on the uh, drought contingency plans, what is Longmont's current reliable water supply? Uh, good evening, uh, council member, uh, members. Uh, Ken Hewson, Water Resources Manager. Um, so Longmont's current, uh, today, our current water supply is about 28,000 acre feet of water uh, based upon what's in our portfolio right now. Our current projection of, of water supply is about 31,000 acre feet when you add in water that we've identified in the planning area that will come to Longmont at time of development. And so I, I, I usually that question is getting towards how much water do we have and how much do we need in the future? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then um, he, he uh, gives some numbers that I'm, I'm not going to take us through because it's a lot too much stuff. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, he comes down to uh, essentially he's worried about the cost of an acre foot of Windy Gap, firm supply of Windy Gap. And he says, what is uh, Longmont storage to reliable yield ratio for the Windy Gap project? He estimates that our firmly yield from our 8,000 acre feet in storage capacity would be about 3,300 3, acre feet <coughs> of firm yield. I think that's approximately correct. Can you confirm that? Um, yes, that's approximately correct. Actually, it's a 2.42 firming ratio so you need 2.42 acre feet of windy gap storage to get one acre foot of firmed water perfect his calculation was 2.41 so that's close, close enough, enough. <laughs> okay um, based on those numbers he is asking uh, that the re he, he's speculating that the cost per acre foot of chimney hollow water is uh, just above $40,000, and he would like an explanation of why 
the cash in lieu fee is not set at $40,000. Um, yes, uh, council member. Um, not sure where the $40,000 number comes from. Um, as it turns out, um, Water Board looks at a lot of metrics, but currently they're placing a little higher emphasis on windy gap firming as the metric to use for cash and lieu because essentially the cash and lieu we're going to be getting in the immediate future um, will go directly to the windy gap firming project. And so what um, Water Board did was take the current project cost estimate for windy gap firming and that's that's the construction cost that's the environmental cost that's the permitting cost design cost all the cost um, for the project it's a little over six thousand dollars per acre foot you multiply that by the 2.42 ratio um, that gets you to uh, what it cost in storage capacity to get one firmed acre uh, I suspect that somebody may have taken the 17 times 2.42. It's 17 is not the cost of the project. 17 is the cost of 2.42 acre feet in the project. So Water Board basically took the cost of the project and multiplied it by 2.42. That's where we came up with that. So, cash. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, actually, I think that's what Mr. Thompson did too. He said that the current estimate of the Windy Gap project cost is. 134 plus million dollars and uh, he used then used the 2.4 his 2.41 uh, storage to reliable yield ratio and he says um, if you divide the 134 million by the um, 3,300 uh, firm yield um, then the resulting cost per acre foot is forty thousand dollars is that a valid computation or is that where his error comes in um you would divide the total project costs by ninety thousand acre feet there, there are ninety thousand acre feet in the project i see there we go thank you very much all right do you want to make a motion yes i i move adoption of of item e all right. Uh, second. All right. It's been moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez uh, that we pass Resolution 2020-18. Any other comment, dialogue, debate? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That passes unanimously. Let's go on to 8K. Dr. Waters, you pulled two. So do you want to deal with 8K first, please? Well, uh, yeah. What I, in the council communication, I'm going to click there. In the council communication, it, the uh, staff asks for direction. Uh, second paragraph, staff proposes providing the details of this communication for council's input, direction, and approval, and then staff will prepare an affordable housing agreement. So I'm not certain how that got on the consent agenda since the staff was asking for, for direction. So I guess I'll, I'll just defer to Kathy and take us through whatever kind of conversation or it's a presentation that we need in order to provide the direction that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Oops. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Kathy Fedler, Housing Community Investment Division Manager again. And I'm not sure a presentation is fully needed, but it's only a couple of slides, so I'll go ahead and run through it. Um, and we will um, work on changing some of the wording in the communication from now on because some of these are getting to be fairly routine I think and probably don't need to they can stay on consent um, so quick, any quick, hold on, quick question ahead. what what direction does staff need is I just want to know as I'm listening to it approving, what, approving the voluntary alternative agreement just that's it yeah okay all right so yep. keep going sorry yep. okay um, so this is for Longmont Family Apartments, which is the development at um, 15th and Pratt or Alta, depending on um, where you're looking at. So it's the uh, voluntary alternative agreement to build affordable rental homes on site. And if you remember, um, because of state law and rent control, um, we it has to be a voluntary, alter they have to voluntarily agree to provide the rental, affordable rental homes on site. They're proposing 88 total rental homes. 
um, and E6 is the um, part of the ordinance that this falls under. This is a little bit hard to see, but it's the, um, just gives you some background on the location um, of the project. It's um, west of Maine um, and north of uh, 15th. Uh, the layout is over on the far left, um, the new design, and then just some schematics. The top one is the old one, which was a uh, large um, building, and um, the two smaller ones, they have um, since redesigned and broken up the, the, the building, so there's less impact on the neighborhood. So this is looking at um, the rental property has a density cap, so if they wanted to, they would have seven units that would be exempt um, from the requirement. Um, the, at 12%, they would have to provide, with the exemption, they would have to provide uh, 10 total affordable homes, and they're providing 88 um, on site. 22 of those homes, or 25%, are going to be affordable at or below 50% of the area median income, and the remaining homes at or below 60% of the area median income. They are providing um, one, two, three, and four bedroom homes, um, which is unusual in apartments. Um, so uh, about 31% of the units as three bedrooms and 18% as four bedroom apartments. Um, some of the things to take into consideration, um, there's annual reporting that's required as part of the inclusionary housing program. The property will be deed restricted to provide 45 affordable homes as permanently affordable. So 51% of the homes will be deed restricted under our program. Um, the developer has redesigned the look, height, and character of the buildings to better address neighborhood concerns. The parking will be 63% more than the 88 spaces that they would be allowed under affordable housing. Again, a high number of three and four bedroom family rental homes. Um, these units are in high demand in the Centennial Park Apartments, which are, is another affordable development. Mm -hmm. And it's convenient to Main Street with access to transportation options. So this does address Council Work Plan Goal B1.1, having a diverse housing stock with higher densities, access to high quality public transportation, food and jobs. It um, more than meets the 12% requirement with 51% of the units deed restricted as affordable. Um, it adds uh, 45 homes that would be counted towards um, our goal with 88 actually um, in the market. Um, and then it does help to meet the 2035 goal. So the developer is also here if you have any questions around that as well. All right. Anything else, Dr. Waters? Nope. Do you want to make a motion? I will. All right. I, did, I was just waiting to see if there were other questions. All right. I moved in uh, approval of resolu resolution 2020-24. Second. Oh. Okay, that's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Council Member Martin. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. All right. Let's move on to, Dr. Waters, you also pulled 8C. I did. The uh, main event for the evening. Yep. So um, we've all seen the, the collection of amendments to the ordinance. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that what would make sense, and I've, uh, we've all seen uh, Councilmember Christensen's amendment, you've seen the others. Uh, it, since I have the floor, what I would like to do is there are, there's a subset of this total of this collection that Councilmember Martin and I worked on, that um, that I'd like to for the council that I'd like to I'd like council consideration and and action either to approve or not, um, because if if we if we approve if the, some of these make sense, um, then it frames a different discussion when we get to uh, the the recommended amendment that we eliminate residential development from all metro districts so what I'd like to do is start with amendment number five can you can you hold on while we get there dr. waters and I and so my question to you mayor Begley will be uh, do I have the floor to work through you have you have a series of amendments may, or one at a time uh, I mean we need to go one at a time right well I, yeah. but but do, uh, I, get, do I get to go to amendment number six after five or do I defer We'll just kind of see how it goes. Let's go. Let's start one at a time. What uh, page of the well? In that case, in that case, I'm not going to start with number five. Yeah, I think I think that I mean personally, what I think I mean the the main. Hold on one second. What what page are you on? I'm on 91, 92. Where are your amendments? 90. 98 for five. Yep. There we are. Page 98. Don't we have to have a movement on? Well, that, he's going to make a motion, I think. And I just before he makes a motion, I want to see where he's at. But what I was going to say is, before we do that, 
there tends there, the, 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 there's tends to be an issue the, the real issue here there's I think there's three basic and you guys don't have to agree with me but there's an amendment by Dr. Waters suggesting that we remove the percentage cap and make it clear that we limit metro districts or residential metro districts to any project that is being built that is 120 percent of AMI and below we have council member Christensen who, who presented her or turned in her amendment that she wanted to get uh, rid of all residential metro districts and then you've got the original amendment or the original ordinance which basically said mixed use development um, and commercial would permit metro districts but not residential and so uh, those are the three options and everything else seems to be a subset of those things mm -hmm. and so as I'm making that observation, how does council want to proceed? Councilman Martin? I, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. Sorry. He I, still has. I have the floor. Yeah, how did I, I lose the floor? You're, you're, you're right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just making a suggestion. Thank you. So, so, so I'll st we'll start with this. Um, we, we, are, we are wrapped up in the amendments on this ordinance, the ordinance itself, and there's a, a ton, I think. There's a lot of good in the ordinance. I think there are a number of things that need to be corrected in the 50% arbitrary limit is one of them but before we even get there I just want to make the statement For personally I am not invested in I've argued to the, to keep metro districts as a tool I'm not invested in metro districts I'm invested in a, a segment of our population that without some tool for financing land and infrastructure the cost of land and infrastructure as part of the cost of housing without a tool to finance that other than the way it's always happened leaves out a huge continuum of our population we heard it last week when kathy did the re the affordable the, the annual first annual report on our inclusionary zoning ordinance the the segment of our population that is least well served are working families and the reason we have 54,000 Boulder County residents today, according to Boulder County Housing, who pay more than 50% of their income for mortgage or rental is the way w this city has financed or, or said to, direct to developers, finance residential development in a way that drives up housing costs, which either eliminates people don't qualify for or people are or pay way more than they need to for housing. That's how we get to 54,000. So if we want to see that number grow, continue to have working class families be housing burdened because they don't qualify for subsidized housing and they, they don't have inventory for a, that's, uh, that's market rates at 120% or below AMI, they end up with only one option, that is to to, to pay more than they should be paying for a home if they want to if they aspire to home ownership and if we if, if at the end of the day we take that tool away we take that option away somebody on this council needs to answer the question what are we going to do other than revert back to what gave us the current the situation where we have too many people housing burdened and we saw in the presentation last week that's the segment that is least well served so with that thought in mind i want to offer amendment if you go to amendment number 12 i've we have heard from the public and we've heard from one another that there's a there's a perception that metro districts are used to build homes for rich people in gated communities and i suppose that's true in some places amendment number 12 assuming we would keep this tool in our toolbox would limit the use of a metro district the would limit financing in a metro district for the cost of land and infrastructure for homes that will be market priced 120 percent or below ami which are the mid-tier homes we identified as priorities for the housing stock in this community in our inclusionary zoning ordinance so i move amendment number 12 and i and i and i know this doesn't this doesn't specifically state a market rate, but we can back into the market rate based on what we know about 120% below an AMI, which is how we determine what, whether or not we, we apply the mid-tier exception at the time of certificate of occupancy. 
uh, under the current ordinance. Second. All right, we've got a mo we've got a motion and a second on the floor. Um, I guess what I would, as we start to talk about this, Eugene, some of the amendments, I'm sure that we will have, I mean, just give us a heads up if we're about ready to do something that is not permitted. Yeah. So, yeah? Heads up. Heads up, okay. <laughs> you want to say something? Just briefly, minor point of clarification. Carolyn White, I'm your outside special counsel for redevelopment. Um, on this, I think maybe just with a minor wording change, you might get it where it needs to be, but the way it was written and the way I think I heard you say it are a little different. You cannot use, a district cannot finance homes. It can finance infrastructure. The cost of land and infrastructure. Right, not To land. support the homes. Correct. Right. right. The written one I have made it sound like you wanted but, them to build the right. affordable no, homes, no. which it cannot do. No, no, right. that was, the intent is for the, the cost of land and infrastructure, which we know are significant percentage of the, of the cost of, of a home, now you got construction, but is the district is used to cover the, to finance the cost of infrastructure in land, land underlying and, the infrastructure. Correct. Yeah. And, yes. and, and I guess I guess what I'd ask is that I, I can I say one more yeah, thing? Uh, the, the, I didn't consult council on this, so there are a number of these that would need to be if they, if conceptually they're they're acceptable are going to have to be uh, uh, you know wordsmith by council. But the the intent here is what's I think clear and is important yeah I was gonna say that can we, let's make the assumption that the words themselves are not what we're putting into statute what, what we're doing is just the intent and then the, the the legal team can come back and do whatever they do to make the magic happen so there is a motion and a second Count, uh, councilmember Christensen when we brought this back it was specifically to restore this as it is now 22 23 amendments have been made I made one and the other two have been made by two members of council in each case these other 22 amendments insult the previous city manager the previous city staff the previous city council mm -hmm. implying that they are stupid that they are uh, liars they're yep. called a false concept um, uh, oxymorons which is not true um, <laughs> that this is not a true statement that I mean again and again and again these are all pure conjecture it says this is not a true statement I mean to me this is in, this is extremely insulting to the previous City Council members to our legal staff, to the rest of our staff, and I, we could spend another four hours discussing 22 amendments, but the point is to straighten up this, to, to just restore this law, which worked quite well for many, many years. Um, it has been called, uh, metro districts have been called an, a critical tool, an essential tool. Well. As I said last time, uh, subprime mortgages was called a critical tool. Credit default swaps were called a critical tools. They melted down our economy. There are good tools, there are bad tools. This is not a tool that is useful except to the developers. I think we have had ample evidence in both in journalism, in Colorado, I mean in United States uh, public interest research group, in numerous people nationwide that this is a problem and that they may work occasionally but more often than not they leave homeowners who um it says they have a choice they don't have a choice because <laughs> where this occurs it mushrooms and then that's all your choice is is to move in if you want any kind of home you have to move into this what i would propose is that we simply restore this law I would give up my uh, my First Amendment, if you like. Um, I think we should just restore the law as it is, as it served us well, and as it will continue to serve us well. That's a good political play, by the way. Hmm? No, that's a good trade. I'm just saying that that's that made me go, oh. Make, make, no, uh, yeah. So that's not uh, trying to be political. No, no, no. That, that's not a bad yes, thing. Yes, you are. Provide no, no. Excuse me, counsel. 
I am trying to provide decent housing for the people of this city. This is not the mechanism for doing that, and we all know that. And that my comment wasn't to be negative. I was actually I saying know. that you, that was, it was, uh, no. It was, it's I am willing to compromise. Yeah. So, okay, Councilor Martin? Um, having been um, <sighs> impugned um, by Council Member Christensen, I do have to say that after significant research, um, I'm fascinated by the idea that because one can put a bunch of false statements um, in the preamble to an ordinance where they don't belong, that then questioning them becomes an insult to the previous city manager, the previous council, um, and anybody else who added five words to this ordinance. In fact, those preambles are false statements. A few unregulated, unnarrowed Metro District Service Plans, which were made under the unmodified state statute, have gone desperately wrong. And even the original ordinance which Council Member Christensen is now proposing to simply restore as it is, um, was an attempt to eliminate by statute some of the more egregious abuses of metro districts. In many ways, that was a good attempt and with the exception of um, this arbitrary 50% uh, limit on the amount of homes that one can have uh, in, uh, inside a mixed-use district, um, it was a pretty good ordinance. I wish we had left it in place and just removed that arbitrary limit uh, originally. I think it would have been, a, it would have saved us all a lot of time and effort. Uh, however, I do have to insist that those front matter uh, elements are false statements and ought to be removed from the ordinance. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Bagley. You know, I, I think we've had plenty of dialogue on this particular subject, and I think inherently most of council knows where our fellow colleagues stand uh, on the issue at large. I will not disagree that there are problematic statements in the ordinance as presented from 2012, I believe it was, um, <coughs> which uh, speaks to the number of amendments offered by council members Waters and Martin that were simply, to a certain extent, wordsmithing or uh, also just stating that uh, language is not factually based and is somewhat uh, opined, if not completely opined. Uh, I don't think that's really at the heart of the matter of what we're discussing tonight in the sense that I think the writing is somewhat on the wall for different reasons, you know. Uh, my stated reasons for support or opposition uh, to special districts in, uh, concerning residential development is based on what I find to be regulatory problems with uh, or statute, statutory problems with regulation from the municipal point of view. Um, I don't think that's going to change because we are not the body that has authority over changing state statute concerning regulation of special districts and as such, I don't find that I've seen any sort of evidence uh, that is concrete to support one side saying that there is adequate ability to regulate. I haven't seen that kind of evidence. I've seen a lot of posturing on both sides of the issue, which is fine. It is what it is. It's what we do somewhat to the extent that we are city council and we are to... Uh, support our positions one way or another uh, on behalf of the constituents and we both see that in different we all see that in our own particular ways so i i would think that it's probably most efficient 
if we, instead of going amendment by amendment, call the bigger question mm -hmm. into account here as far as will we allow any special districts concerning residential development? Um, I appreciate that there is a motion on the floor and that's what we're debating currently and as such I will not support the amendment or the motion on the amendment because I don't think it's an efficient use of our time based on the fact that we've already spoken about this uh, ad nauseum. So those are my comments. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring, quiet down there. You want to chime in? Any thoughts? Um, no, You're just like, no, I'm I, good down here. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for electing me. No, um, you know, I guess my something I was going to say later on, I can, I can go ahead and say it now. Um, you, you know, there were things, even as I read the initial, the, for the first time I read the ordinance, there were some very um, opinion-based opinion statements that can be altered without um, removing what the, the intent of the original ordinance was. Um, you know, I, I would be fine with removing some of those statements, but other than that, I, I would move that we refer back, revert back to the um, original or the 2017 um, ordinance. Straight up, you mean? Yes. Okay. yes. Councilman Peck? Thank I'm you, and I'm sorry, you were, you were in the queue. It's fine. So um, I agree with both uh, remarks that the two past counselors said, but going back to our outside council who restated what the statute says, that metro districts are for land and infrastructure, when I look at Amendment 12, it says that, and then it goes on to say, and possible extraordinary benefits, such as transit, microgrids, carbon-free carbon -free neighborhoods, distributed energy resources, childcare, early childhood, and post-secondary education facilities. This is the problem with these metro districts, is that once they're established and the government is there, then they start adding stuff. Or in the uh, service plan, like the one that we just had, I was against that because of the uh, recreation center that they threw in. It's supposed to be for infrastructure and land, and the residents, end up funding all sorts of things. And um, if we stuck to the statute and there was a regulatory component to it, then I would have no problem with metro districts. But as it is, it's just a free-for-all. So I don't agree with this Amendment 12, and I, I would not, uh, I, I don't want to go through 22 amendments and wordsmith them, so. I, I'm just going to ask one thing. Just one thing. Um, uh, my question is, where, the, in my mind, as I look through the amendments, I, I could, I can see everybody's point of view. But what do you guys think of Amendment Thirteen? Just to, if, as we vote on this, the, if, in my mind, if it's if it's a mixed, if we went back to the original ordinance and said that and crossed out a mixed use district should not consist of more than fifty percent by square foot by square footage of residential gross floor area. Would would that be allowed? That one single amendment. If if, if we, I mean, where I'm at is, I mean, uh, uh, my only ask of everything would be that, so that mixed use were included, but it's not the arbitrary fifty percent. Means it could be thirty, could be sixty, but as long as it's true mixed use. Yeah, Councilmember Christensen, I'm just I'm just asking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody understands that there isn't a magic number of 50, but 51 is a majority. That's all. They're just saying a majority. Otherwise, you could build a huge housing district and put one coffee shop in and call it a mixed-use district. It just gives you a set amount of 50%. Okay. I just want to know. And uh, that's, I think, yeah. the, I think that is understood by most people, um, and I think that was a good thing for them to put in. Otherwise, it can lead to uh, all kinds of abuse. Okay. And, uh, all right. Uh, Council uh, Mayor, hold on one second. Council Mayor Waters jumped okay. in the queue. So, Dr. Waters? I'll defer. Right. Doc, uh, sorry, Dr. Martin? Doc Martin? <laughs> I wish I were Dr. Martin. Um, uh, I just have a statement 
that I think if, if we're going to be jumping around and considering amendment, either amendment, it looks like what we're talking about now mm -hmm. is either um, adopting amendment 13 only or adopting um, uh, or restoring the ordinance as it stands. Yeah. Um, and, and both of those are by far better than the than some possible outcomes, so I'm feeling a little better. But I do feel like we've entirely lost the context here and that we are talking about winning and losing rather than getting the best stuff for Longmont, which is why I hold the positions that I hold. Um, in recent years, um, we've moved Longmont's land use code to include more and more mixed use developments. We've encouraged higher density planning. We've acknowledged that mixed use leads to walkable neighborhoods, a more varied housing stock, and higher quality life for more residents. It reduces traffic congestion and eliminates food and service deserts. Yeah, and I think all of us are for taking our city in that direction in terms of land use and urban design. Um, we have asserted, I think as Dr. Waters mentioned earlier, that all the mixed use and residential developments were built without metro districts just fine. But in fact, that is the opposite of true. What we got built were luxury apartments and executive homes. And that is the cause of the congestion at our major intersections. It's the cause of the affordable housing crisis and the, and the mid-tier housing crisis that we have. If we had been able to use incentives by the city, which is the big carrot of, okay, we'll accept this service plan, then um, uh, I think that uh, we would have a different housing inventory now and it would be much more like we want Longmont to become. Okay, since the option of metro districts with dense residential subdivisions included in them have been on the table, we've seen proposals that align with the city's goals and vision much more than what we saw before. One builder told me it would have been much easier to just build 200 executive homes than what I'm looking to build now. And that's how we got too many executive homes and too many luxury apartments. Now let's build the right thing. I'm okay with restricting metro districts to mixed use and industrial and all the other zoning things and not pure residential because I don't see a big future in um, residential only developments. And I think that's a good thing because we need to have a dense urban design in Longmont and that'll, this will, will promote that concept. So I am, I'm, I'm happy with that and I would support um, adopting uh, Amendment 13 only and leaving the rest of the statute as it stands. Dr. Waters? Uh, since Amendment 13 is not on the floor yet, um, I Sorry. want to make a, this is, we, we, I get a second turn and then last but, word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, the, the purpose of, for at least for my part, the purpose of what I tried to do with amendments here is um, make, assuming we keep the, an ordinance on the books, uh, and, and frankly, I, I said last time, there was a lot that I agreed with in the ordinance. That we that we repealed last a year ago, among and I said there's some things that I didn't think made sense. Some of the things that I don't think make sense are the things that we that I've pointed out as has Councilmember Martin that are simply uh, opinion or conjecture. Councilmember Christensen labels that as insulting. I would say somebody somebody has to be accountable for putting that kind of stuff in an ordinance that makes that's ungrounded, indefensible, in many cases. But the purpose for, for what we're trying to do, for what I'm trying to do, and I know this is true for Councilman Martin, is to, is to add to the ordinance in ways that protect 
what the ordinance was intending to protect and make it more uh, uh, focused on the very audience we're trying to serve or the, the, that, that part of our resident, uh, the continuum of incomes for our residents that we, to which we need to be more responsive. So uh, Council Member, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez uh, has talked about this as posturing. I'm gonna say that is absolutely not true. This is solution seeking. You can, you can see it any way you want to see it. But, I, but we put in a fair amount of time trying to, trying to bring to this council what, what might be acceptable, not to me or to Council Member Barton, but to the collection of, to the majority of the council in service to a segment of the population that we're walking away from. If we, if we take residential units and if, and if we're gonna do that le leaving the arbitrary uh, restriction on 50%. What I added to the last part of this, and, I've, and it shows up several places here in other amendments, is, is clarity. F from, for my purpose, I have asked the question several times. In fact, every time we're in this conversation, what are we trying to accomplish? Could we just agree on an objective or two and then talk about what's, what's, what's the ordinance that helps us achieve that objective or those objectives. I've tried to do the same thing with the, among the amendments here. And the language at the last part of this, are all, in terms of extraordinary benefits, are all goals we've set as a council. Carbon-free neighborhoods, distributed energy systems, inter early childhood education. It seems to me that we ought to be explicit that those are the kinds of extraordinary benefits that a developer would have to bring to the city to help advance not only our housing objectives, but the other objectives we've, as we've, as we've said are our goals that are important long-term for the future of the community. So I, if there's an alternative, if, if we choose to walk away from this, or I think if we leave it at, at, at an arbitrary 50%, uh, we're sending a real message to that portion of our population who don't qualify for subsidized housing and can't afford what's gonna come without ways to finance housing to get more units in the marketplace that can take advantage of our mid-tier exception. So I, I'm just curious what the message, what, what do we think the message should be to that section of the population that we are simply saying, you know what, we've worked real hard to, to, to come up with a plan for subsidized housing 50, now it's going to, I suspect, going to be 50 cent or below, and below. And we simply are not willing to work hard enough or creatively enough. We're not willing to take on our, the, the opportunity to regulate in ways that we can to serve a segment of our population that has been ignored when it comes to housing policy for at least a decade. Yeah, there's a, I wanted, I wanted to vote, but you can go ahead and say something, Council Member Christensen. Okay. Are we doing, we're not following Robert's rules then. No, well, she hasn't had her second turn yet. Yeah, she's spoken twice. Did you speak twice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, let's go. Let's so look. we're not, so we're, I just, I just want to be clear. No, 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 no we'll that we we're not follow, following I, Robert's I, I rules. Did, I only had it down that she spoke once, but let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and. Can we, what, can we vote on the ordinance? Can we have a reminder of the ordinance that's. The ordinance, the, the, motion, that's the, on the, the motion that's currently on the floor is doc amendment, 12. amendment 12, and it was seconded, and it was to uh, basically the long and short of it is to limit residential metro districts to 120 percent, um, if if it's basically 120 percent of AMI and below. So, Councilor Peck, um, I'm not going to vote for this amendment, uh, but I, I do want to make a different statement because. I, th I think that we have historically forgotten <coughs> why we do not have affordable housing. We had an affordable housing ordinance years ago and it worked. We have not had anything for 10 years. So when you say we don't have any middle tier housing, it's because we were trying to get back to what our ordinance was. I personally think that we should let that inclusionary zoning ordinance work. It hasn't, it hasn't had any time to work. It's been a year. So we're, we're, it, it is working. We just got 88 units. We're talking about in, um, another Aspen Meadows. Um, so when we talk about there will be nothing if we don't do this, I'm not sure I can say that's accurate yet. We haven't 
given it time. So um, I think that our inclusionary zoning ordinance actually does address this without the metro districts. Yes. So um, I, I'm fine with just uh, going back to the original motion of taking it back to the 2012 ordinance. All right, let, let's go. There's a vote. 2017, I mean. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. So there is, th let's go ahead and vote. Anybody object? So we're Could going to the So, on so the, the, the motion is voting on Amendment 12. Oh. And let me go ahead and, and Amendment 12 specifically says, and my computer is super slow. All right, it says that we are going to strike the word outweigh the potential adverse effects and put in the following language. So it reads in totality. The likely public benefits resulting from the district will advance the objectives listed in subsection A. Special or metro districts financing for residential units shall be limited to the cost of land and infrastructure of home prices at 120% of AMI and below, and possible ex extraordinary benefits such as transit solutions, microgrids, carbon-free neighborhoods, distributed energy resources, and child care. Which means that if, su just, just pointing out that if subsequently, if we don't have you any- stop short of the rest oh. of the I, uh, I'm sorry, early childhood and post-secondary education facilities. My concern is by voting on this now, what could happen is if we don't do residential, does this apply to residential and mixed units? Mixed use? Yes. That's how I read it. So, Councilmember uh, Christensen? There's nothing, this is an ordinance as a whole that talks about how the city deals with special districts, special district law, state special district law. There is nothing in this ordinance as a whole that forbids the, de the new development of special districts for childhood education or cultural special districts or um, any special districts except residential districts. So when in this particular thing you're including Electric grids, really, do we want a developer setting up an electric grid? I mean, <laughs> or special districts for childhood education that only applies to one tiny little area? This is confusing things because it is uh, not uh, uh, actually uh, uh, what the state uh, law is. I, I, okay, so I'm going to let, council, let Council Mayor Martin say something. You can have the last word, Dr. Waters, but we're going to get back to, yeah, I opened, I mean, we're going to go back to two turns or else we'll be here all night. Okay, so council that was the third turn. Yeah, so I, I'm going to let you, I, I know, you can go ahead and say it briefly, and then count, Dr. Waters will say his, what he has to say, and okay. unless Council Member Hidalgo Farring wants to say something, we will vote. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I would just like to point out that no, this doesn't say we're going to set up electric grids with metro districts. In fact, uh, electric infrastructure is one of the things that's, that is prohibited yes. um, to be paid for by uh, metro districts. However, the financing of, of uh, energy management systems, which are the different from electric grids, are not prohibited and they are infrastructure. Uh, so uh, I just want to point out that the city of Fort Collins, of, which has uh, um, taken some very forward-looking steps in terms of ur urban design, is using the incentive of metropolitan district financing to pay for division, uh, subdivisions which are all electric and energy managed in addition to uh, several other kinds of special infrastructure um, uh, including green buildings and also including uh, affordable housing. So uh, based on their example, this is a proper use and a proper restriction. Thank you. Dr. Waters? Yeah, the, 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 and just for whatever it's worth, this isn't suggesting special districts, single purpose special districts. This is consistent with the language metro districts. This would be a metro district, would be multi-purpose for residential development using the district to finance homes that would fit our mid-tier exception and below. And as part of the metro district, if a, de if, if a developer wanted to present an application that uh, was specific with in terms of the extraordinary benefits that matched or advanced our goals as a council. Uh, so this is not, this is, if a, if a developer suggested 
that they wanted to build sufficient facilities to house an early childhood education program. I, I, just, I guess I wonder why we would not want to see that uh, since the first step or the first kind of foundation in uh, providing more and better for our youngest residents would be facilities in which play, uh, programs could be developed. Now, that's not suggesting that they're going to develop the program, um, but, but we have examples in town right now of co-ops, young moms, part of co-ops, um, who, who made a deal with the church to be able to use their facilities. What if in their neighborhood, where we're building, we're requiring at least 12% of one of the housing stock to be up for permanently affordable houses, that we wouldn't also say to a, to a developer, if you'd like an approval of an application, add an early childhood facility there, and then let's see what the city could do working with others to leverage the opportunity to get a program there to serve folks in that neighborhood. Why we wouldn't want to see that, or a carbon-free neighborhood, or any of the other things that we've identified as goals for the, for at least for this council and for this city. Uh, why we would not signal to developers that your application will be more, uh, will receive a, a more favorable review if in addition to workforce housing or attainable housing, we get to see these other benefits that it, the other kind of assets or development that would advance the city's goals. That's the whole reason for the language. All right, let's go ahead and vote. The motion has been made that we include Amendment 12. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 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 The motion uh, fails with Councilman Martin and Dr. Waters uh, four, and then the other five of us against. I'd like to move Amendment 13. Second. All right. Do you guys mind if we just take a straight up vote on this? Because we all know where we stand. All in favor of Amendment 13, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. nay. That was a nay. I think, I think just to be clear, you'll, you'll correct me. I th I mean, I'm just guessing here, but the motion fails with council members Martin, myself, and Dr. Waters for, and council member Hidalgo Faring, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, council member Christensen, and council member Peck against. Did I get that vote right? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, so I just want to say, first of all, uh, a couple things. Um, I really appreciate the 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 council member Waters talked about co-ops because I think co-ops could be a very useful thing uh, going forward and I really wish that more developers would explore co-ops that has nothing to do with regulating co-ops but I think they, they could be a very useful uh, a tool if you will also uh, when asked about creative possibilities for getting the kind of missing housing that we talk about I have been unequivocally and unapologetically uh, talking about new urbanism uh, since I was elected in 2017. And that really equates to, which I know there's only a certain metabolism right now in Longmont for this, but it's talking about more density and you know higher heights and, and, and those kinds of, of concepts that are hard for folks that you know have lived in Longmont historically as somebody who grew up here in Longmont it was definitely not the kind of city I grew up in. But understanding that some of the biggest challenges that we have with real estate, not just in Longmont, but regionally in the Front Range, is cost of land. Cost of land is a regional issue. It's not specific to Longmont. It's not specific to Denver or Boulder or Loveland or Fort Collins. It is, it's a regional thing. Um, and so what do you do? You, you make the most of your land, right? And I don't think that I mean, I think we're going in the right direction as we adopted the, L the, the new land development code as far as increasing density, increasing the allowance for height. But we don't, we, in my opinion, didn't go far enough. And I've been unapologetic, unapologetic about that stance. Um, I think also that, you know, this would be a compromise. It's a compromise for definitely 
uh, Council Member Christensen, and I know it is for me, and, and Council Member Peck, and I know it's it's a ridiculous, arbitrary number of 50% versus 51%, but it still technically allows metro districts to just go back to the 2012 ordinance. It still technically allows these special districts with residential components. That in and of itself is a compromise. Otherwise, we're going to continue doing these up and down votes on a four to three basis. Um, and I know there's a lot of warts if you will, that have been pointed out by council members Martin and, and Waters as far as the, the terminology that are encompassed in this. But I think at the end of the day, this is as close as this council can possibly get to agreeing on this subject because we, again, talked about this ad nauseum. And so I move just to go straight to the 2012 ordinance and approve that language or reinstate that language. I'll second that. Um, Councilmember Martin. I just have a question uh, for Count, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, um, who has acknowledged, I believe, that there are warts in the existing ordinance, certainly a bunch of, of really egregious, uh, either false or unsubstantiated statements in the front matter that do not belong in a city ordinance at all. Um, so my question for Mayor Pro Tem is, why don't you want to fix that, sir? Do I believe it affects the function of the ordinance? No. I'd like to submit that what it does do is provide the public who um, are being fooled uh, with arguments um, that are unsubstantiated and they innocently believe they're telling the truth. And I think we ought to um, make our ordinance as factual as it can be. So I would like to see at least the front matter cleaned up and otherwise. All right. Well, we have a, we have a motion on the floor, Dr. Waters. Yeah, I guess um, I understand the motion. What I don't understand is uh, the last time, the, the, how we got here uh, was a motion that you made, Mayor Bagley, on which I think you had a, a, a unanimous vote to do exactly what we have done. Uh, we responded in exactly the way we were asked to respond. And now the message is, well, you shouldn't have done that because it's going to take too much of our time. So uh, how do we want to do this? Uh, last time we talked about it, this made sense. Now it doesn't make sense? I, 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 I mean, I, I'm just I, wondering. I, I guess, I'll, respond. I'll respond. So I guess, I guess in my mind, the uh, two things um, I'd like to answer Councilmember Martin's question um, alongside the mayor pro tem is that to me the meat of this is are we or are we not going to allow metro districts for residential neighborhoods I mean essentially that's what it comes down to um, and uh, in law we're always it's called dicta it's like people will read a Supreme Court case or, or a statute about the legislative intent and at the end of the day it does not matter you could say well uh, we are creating metro districts because at the end of the day uh, we feel that they're really, really cool, but they kind of suck, and our kids like uh, eating green peas and, and, and broccoli. It doesn't matter if it's in there. At the end of the day, does it or does it allow residential metro districts? And so even if we cleaned up and we spent like all night cleaning up the preamble to the ordinance, it's really not going to have a, a, a legal impact on the ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that uh, I've always said that, uh, I mean, uh, Gordon Pedro is here in the audience, and he always used to say, count to four, Bagley. Learn to count to four. I'm counting to four. And, uh, and sometimes it just, sometimes you just can't get, can't get your fourth. And so right now this council's pretty split four to three, and I'm actually grateful for Council Member Christensen saying she'd pull her amendment, you know, because at the end of the day, returning to what it was is a hell of a lot better than what it could be. And so... Um, I'm, I'm, and like I said, it's a, it was a it was good politics, and, and that's what I meant. So I'm willing to play good politics and say I'm willing to go back on the compromise if it means going back to what we were before rather than taking away mixed use metro districts. So that, that's, that, that's, I mean, as my mom always said, you want pancakes, you want to go hungry. I guess there's politics and there's principle. Yeah. And um, uh, I mistakenly concluded that we were serious about the task or the charge and the opportunity we were given 
uh, to think through what what was in the ordinance that needed some attention and in my view needs correction so I don't care if we're here to Friday frankly uh, to follow through on what we were asked to do uh, and, I, if, and if every one of these goes down on a on a four three or five two or six one vote uh, that that really is is not of concern to me because I because we're here to do the people's work and you can and you can and the, the beautiful thing is you can make motions I, I mean li literally you can make those motions but right now there's a motion on the floor to return to just basically reset the button to the previous ordinance and uh, let's go ahead and vote on that all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed aye. nay okay or so nay. Yeah, I know I, I, I see so that the motion uh, passes five to two with Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Mart or uh, Councilmember uh, Waters uh, against um, now that said the question becomes are the other motions on the floor yes you, okay Councilmember Martin what would you like to yes um, in the interest of shortening things up, because uh, I also took the mayor at his word and oh, said, no, that no, 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 I'm not. <laughs> but just as long as you're not, I am one of seven here, man. <laughs> so it's like we can vote on these if oh, we can. No, no, no. I, yeah. I took the. Let's let, let me finish okay, my statement good, good, before good. you deny it, please. <laughs> um, uh, I took the mayor at his word that we would consider each amendment. And so uh, I, for one, made no particular effort to keep the number of amendments small. Um, however, uh, I do think that we should at least consider taking some of the damaging falsehoods uh, out of the front matter because uh, we don't like misleading our people. I don't think we should be embarrassed as a city by badly crafted ordinances. and. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, as was said before, they don't affect the substance of the law. I therefore move that we, ad that we ad adopt amendments um, one, two, um, three, uh, four, and uh, I will leave out number five because it has some substance to it. Uh, six. Six, thank you. Um, and eight, essentially by striking them, although the, uh, we would expect that the uh, legal counsel would, would uh, clean it up to make the ordinance uh, of proper form. I believe that uh, that this would not change the subject of, um, of uh, uh, the amendment in any way, but I, for one, would be rather less embarrassed by it. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we accept Amendment 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8. So let's go ahead and vote on that. I'll invite, I mean, but sorry, Council Member Christensen? Are we yeah, yeah no, we can, no, we oh, can. Okay. I was just hoping not, but yes, we can. <laughs> Once again, we've been called unprincipled and lazy for not taking the time to discuss all 22 amendments. That's putting words I in my mouth. Object well, guys, to guys, it's okay. Uh, passing any more amendments. We've already passed the law, and um, I don't see any need to continue to wordsmith something that has stood the test of time. Two people on council seem to object to these things and they offer no reason, but I mean, except that they object to them and they don't think they're true. So <coughs> I won't vote for this at all. All right, anybody else? All right, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of these amendments, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. I said aye. You were an aye? Aye, aye? Okay, so the motion, did you say nay or aye? Nay. 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 Okay, so the. <laughs> so the motion passes five to two with council members Christensen and council members Peck um, dissenting and the five of us um, being eyes. So, all right. I move amendment 10. All right. Uh, hold on. So. 
Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded by Do uh, Dr. Waters, then seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Is there any debate or questions on this issue? Councilmember Peck. Um, I do have a problem with it because it's it's uh, a little bit vague. Just saying that there was no un no unfounded. Uh, there's nothing to support this statement. There should be something in here about about the service plan then that this has to be included in the service plan mm -hmm. rather than just a vague uh for example it says the higher mill lev levy in district projects may make these residents less inclined to support other city property tax increases um this depends upon the service plan and whether the uh, the mill the levies mill levy is increased within the project um, and that's uh, so that that's my opinion okay uh, hold on council member Doggle fairing what would you like to say so um, based on so I spoke with the financial director or one of the finance guys at um, Thompson School District mm -hmm. who did they did a district survey uh, um, of the 2016 uh, mill levy override um, just trying to get input as to why the um, why it didn't pass and they found overwhelmingly that people who lived in the um, in metro districts in Loveland or in the Thompson Valley uh, the school district um, voted down the mill levy and so you know there it's it, it could play a role it really could play a role and so I don't I don't think it's pretty strong to say that there's no evidence presented because as people are delving deeper into collecting um, data that it's it, it could that could be potentially be a risk that we take uh, mayor pro tem rodriguez thank you mayor bagley uh the motion simply strikes this language proposed in, in amendment 10 um I don't think that at this time there really is empirical data to prove one way or another and I don't think it affects the form and function of what has been approved at this point to strike said language because uh, it does in my opinion appear to be conjecture regardless of whether you agree with said conjecture or not is is not pertinent um, it, it provides no function in the ordinance so it makes really little difference if we strike the language from it and that's my opinion and i will be voting for the uh, the motion so we can keep talking about it but again i'm just counting votes here so do you mind if we vote all right let's go ahead all in fa so the motion is to approve amendment 10 which strikes the wording that says the higher mill levy and district projects may make these residents less inclined to support other city property tax increases so all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed say nay nay who's that councilmember christensen so the motion uh, passes six to one with council member Christensen against and six of us four. All right, anybody else? All right, it looks like we have gotten through Metro districts. So, all right, you may, you may, you, you may clap regardless of, of, uh, of how you feel this vote ended, it's over, so. Yes, as, as the press is like, thank goodness, let people start reading our paper again. No. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, Council Member Christensen. Just for clarity, can you tell me which one of these amendments were accepted? So there, uh, the motions, the motion, so Amendment 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And specifically, 12 and 13 were voted on and failed. Mayor, well, I think don't we need to approve the introduction of the ordinance with these amendments? Well, the, we, well we, we actually took a vote to put it back to the old ordinance. Okay. So the old ordinance is, we did that. Okay. So yeah. Except Council like Christensen, point. yes. Like, no, go ahead. I would like to point out by passing Amendment 1, we eliminated um, mixed use metro districts. No, we no. I'm sorry, we did not. No, we, we, it wasn't your amendment. It was, it was Council Member Martin's amendment. number one. Change pay for to finance. Yeah, pay for to finance. Um, I have something before she leaves. 
Uh, can we? Hey, 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 you're getting paid by the hour, lady. Stick around. Well, yeah. No. <laughs> you're, you're about ready to get point one here. Hold on a second. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to be here and um, listening to uh, to us and um, and providing with your um, objective expertise. And we actually, really she can't it. charge if she's not advancing the case. So thank on. Just thank on. I'm just kidding. I'm sure. <laughs> get out of here. Go home. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. All right, so let's go on to, uh, that, that concludes items removed from the consent agenda. We have no general business. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to final call public invited to be heard. Anybody want to, come on up, Ms. Bassett. Where's Joe tonight? Bassman. Or Bassman. Where's Joe? Is he really? <laughs> Can you get up there to the mic so we can I, hear you? I broke thank a tooth, you. Oh, and, no. and it, now I'm growing bone to get it back. But so thank you for bearing with me. Um, I had two things. One was the this uh, Councilman Waters. I do share the um, desire, deep desire, strong desire, to provide housing options for young families who are uh, making a what, what are we saying, 120% of the, uh, you know, the median income? Uh, that's hard to raise a family on. And if uh, these special districts, metro districts, if they can add on more and more debt as they go down, you know, a, a child care center, uh, electric, something, whatever, that risks that a lot of these families would have to declare bankruptcy. That's what I've read in the um, Denver Post, and that's what I've heard from people. And any, any program that would risk that is unacceptable to me. Because then, you, then uh, what, this is a Tabor workaround, and uh, I believe it was, pro uh, just connecting dots, I believe it was set up by developers. In the old days, didn't the city um, borrow the money? Uh, municipal debt, municipal bonds to build streets and put up electric poles. And now it's, um, ta thanks to Tabor, Mr. Douglas Bruce, um, that's been taken away. That power has been taken away from cities. And it is wrong for cities then to put it on residents with, um, with an open-ended debt ceiling. I have, in fact, no debt ceiling. So I don't know what the answer is but I share your desire, deep desire, to provide housing. But let's find a, a mechanism that does not put these same families at the risk of being booted out of their homes. Right. Okay. Thank you. And the next. Yeah. All right. Go more. ahead. I forgot to start the timers. Go ahead. You're the oh, only one. Oh, thank you. Um, there's a development up off 66 on the south side. I've spoken of it. It pierces my heart to drive by that. Every single house, is the roof goes like this. This is south. And they're not very large homes. I'm going to go by and see who it is. There's not a solar panel on a single one of those. Which is, and I'm going to quote Greta, how dare we, how dare we approve um, such residences without a single solar panel on, uh, Platte Valley is going to have what they want. They're looking at solar farms. Those roofs are already built to accept solar panels. I think that, um, pardon my passion, um, that Platte River Valley, it's, um, they're gonna, not going to go 100% for another 30 years. That's unacceptable. And I suppose that if they do solar, they would have to purchase the solars to put on their p farms. Except I understand that they, what I read was they're looking for somebody to farm it out to. And that's not, that's not a very efficient method. So I think, plat um, I would like, let me see, and the number of solar panels on, on Longmont roofs is a fraction of 1%, a tiny fraction of every, one out of every 100 roofs has solar. That's outrageous in this climate. And um, 
I want to see the, I want, I, I would like to have a moratorium on building until the, this city gets its um, building code lined up with the climate emergency. In particular, renewable energy from solar. It is so obvious. Mm. And I, how to, I just get, start getting creative. I don't know, a, a um, foundation or what do you call a fund that people could, we could all contribute to and, and this could be available to help people purchase. Or um, when developers come in and want put up these roofs, that they are required to put solar on them. That's just a, it, that's the, the way it is during the solar crisis. I mean, the, the climate crisis. And um, I thank you for, I, I really would like to have housing stock for young families, but all I would not want to have the city. All, all right, thank you, Ms. Ms. Bassman. I'm gonna have to cut you off. I'll give you six minutes. But thank you. Oh, thank right. you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're very passionate. We love you when you're coming. Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right, somebody great. Said, I told somebody I was a tree hugger. But before that, I'm... I you you, you hug on. The underdog. You just hug on. Thank you. Thank All right, let's go ahead to mayor and council comments. I do have something I... Well, one second. I like saying your name. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. Thank you. Um, so I did receive... Actually, I've received a couple of emails in regard to the uh, coronavirus and does Longmont have any plans or how do we deal with, with um, something to this magnitude if it ever gets to Longmont? Uh, so as part of our emergency operations, we do have a pandemic plan that we use before, during the, it's me, okay. during the uh, SARS um, situation. And so I know the emergency management group is moving through that and looking at it. Um, Council Member Hidalgo Faring, we are working on the communication side with them to try to pull some information together and really partnering with Boulder County Public Health. They're the ones that are taking the lead on this. We did um, actually have some conversation at the last emergency preparedness meeting around what would happen if something um, like that did happen in Longmont. I'd be happy to send you all the information that we're gathering that from OEM for your yes. own information. And of course, we'll be getting that out to the public as well. Okay, thank you. Councilman Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I just want to say, um, first of all, in, in response to constituent Shelley, um, that I also agree that Longmont should have uh, a deeper penetration of rooftop solar panels in the current time than we have. I have it on very good authority from um, uh, the uh, head of engineering for the Platte River Power Authority um, that uh, the Longmont distribution grid could stand a penetration of up to 30% of residences having rooftop solar before it would re require structural mitigation um, of our distribution grid that would uh, involve infrastructure investment. So I hope within the next couple of months that we will find a way to remove our disincentive um, to people putting solar panels on their roof. At the same time, as a servant of truth, uh, I would like to say that first Platte River Power Authority has still committed to being 100% renewable by the year 2030, which is only 10 years from now. Um, and uh, that solar purchased and deployed at a utility scale is still very much less expensive than uh, solar generation on individual rooftops or public buildings. So I understand that we are all very passionate about this. Uh, I want it to be possible for residents to um, not pauper themselves by putting, in order to put solar uh, panels on their roofs. Uh, I will always say that never has there been a prohibition against doing that in Longmont, um, and people still haven't done it. Um, so, and we have a few mechanisms for uh, causing uh, 
uh, developers or builders rather to put solar panels on roofs um, and one of them is a metro district service plan so I'm really sorry that we are so touchy about that but it could be uh, you know a, a solar neighborhood could in fact um, be part of a metro district service plan uh, as a servant of truth I have to say that I'm really unhappy with uh, a, a cultural development that I think has trickled down from the national level and it's becoming ubiquitous here in Longmont, which is um, that we say things that aren't true a lot without references, without substantiation, and um, that somehow their um, having been said for a long time makes them truer than they really are. Um, I don't like that, and I think that we need to train ourselves to get away from that habit and use a better, more rigorous mode of thought. Um, I am going to therefore start a, a private practice of debunking false statements that are made by members of the city council. Um, I will do the research put in the uh, substantiating evidence and send myself an email to my public email account with the keyword Geppetto's workshop in it. Um, subsequently, anyone who would like to access um, evidence that um, a particular statement made publicly is false can simply file a CORA request asking for every Marsha Martin email in the Long on the Longmont server, making it easy, that contains the keyword hashtag Geppetto's workshop. So keep them coming, folks, and thanks. All right, anything else? All right, well, seeing nothing else, city manager, do you have any comments? No comments, Mayor, Council. City attorney. No comments, Mayor. All right. I move adjournment. I'll second that. Anybody not in agreement? We have consensus. We're adjourned.